Good morning. How is everybody doing? Great to see you this morning for our one gathering of today, uh, December the 26th. Great to see you, whether you join us in this room or online. Uh, welcome to our gathering. Why don't you find someone you haven't spoken to? Uh, wave to them, give them a high five, elbow. Uh, wake somebody up in the house if they're still sleeping uh, as we get ready to continue in worship.
God is ever faithful, ever present, ever true, ever strong. He will never fail us. Come on, 2020 new. We need you, God. We need you. Promise maker, promise keeper. This morning I was watching just her her um, note and uh, her, her response was like, you know what? Every day is not good, but I choose to find something good in every day. Every day is not good, but I'm going to choose to find something good in every day. And this is a woman who's experienced loss, who's experienced heartache, 
And I thought it was, what a great lesson that we can all learn. Like, what, what love is this that God would, would lay down his life for us? And how awesome he is, how faithful he is. And I'm going to find the goodness in this day because he is my Savior. Because he's my friend. single individual who woke up this morning and, and gathered here to come into your presence, Lord. I pray that amidst this crazy and uncertain and joyous and for some rough and difficult season that you bring hope and you continue to inspire through your peace and, and your light and that you bring comfort to those who need comfort and that amidst, amidst all of it that we take comfort in what love is this and what love and what incredible joy and peace that we can find in you who so generously and so willingly and lovingly came to earth and came for us, Lord. 
And I just pray your blessing upon today's worship service, upon everyone in this room, that you would encourage and that you would uplift with your spirit amidst this new year. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. on the day after Christmas. Did you guys have a good Christmas? Yes, sir. Awesome, awesome. So does anybody have any cool like Christmas traditions that you have as a family? I don't know about you guys, but we do something in our family where my wife has done this thing for a few years and it's super awesome. We all dress up in these Christmas PJs and they're super awesome. And no, I'm not going to show any photos of those. You can just, I'll just leave that to your imagination, but it's fun. We, we have a good time with it. Um, uh, I think another piece of our tradition is we're a bunch of foodies in our family, so we love to eat. How many, how many people here just really, really, eat? I didn't even, I didn't even finish the question. I got hands. That's awesome. So yes, love to eat, right? So um, what is the best part of the Christmas meal? Dessert. I'm We've got the right audience here. This is awesome. All right, so here's a loaded question. And there is a right and a wrong answer here. What is the best dessert out there? Okay, let's get more specific. Oh, I like ice cream pie. What's the best cookie out there? Okay, the right answer is Oreo. And so I want to be very clear. Anything else was a very good answer, but it was not correct. So... I don't know about the rest of you, but during the pandemic, while people were hoarding toilet paper and they were hoarding hand sanitizer and all that kind of stuff, my family, um, we were hoarding Oreos. So my wife gets all the credit in the world for this. This was my birthday present. So like, I don't know what you want for yours. I just literally wanted Oreos, okay? And, but who can look at this picture and who knows what's missing from this picture? Milk, right? And listen, this isn't even just us. It is milk's favorite cookie. Oreo has literally branded it that, okay? So now I'm gonna do something, and there's a lot that could go wrong right now. I'm just gonna throw that out there. So my wife, she is so incredibly awesome that she bought, and you can go ahead and go to the next one, because I want you to see this. This is the close-up of this. There's an Oreo dunking set. And in case like dunking it with your fingers wasn't good enough, and in case you wanted to like have some fun with it, Oreo actually created this dunking set. And I'm not gonna lie, I could have just told you the story, but I kind of want to eat Oreos while I'm talking. And so you take it, you do that, and you, you, you dunk it in there. Now, who knows what happens if you leave the Oreos in there a little too long? It's so soggy and it falls in, right? That's not a bad thing though, right? Because then you get to drink it later. So what you do, can you hear? I'm good. That's a little bit of a mess, but I'm okay with that. Is that good? Is that good? So now, now I've done that. When I practiced all this, I didn't actually eat the Oreo. So there's a couple seconds of awkward silence is me getting that Oreo down. Here's the point of all that. Milk is the transformative superpower that all Oreos need, right? So, it reminds me of a scripture. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn with us. Otherwise, we're going to show it up here. Matthew 5, all right? Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, verses 13 through 16, simply says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Now, we all know this, a lot of people know this, it's the Sermon on the Mount. And often it's really easy to take a look and when you're reading scripture, to read it as something that was written thousands of years ago. 
And to, it's hard to contextualize it sometimes. But what I want to do is I want to take like, all right, we're here at CFC and you can go ahead with the next graphic. So if we were to take and we were to go out and we were to say, all right, let's go to the Sea of Galilee. All right, so if we were to zoom out, you literally have to go halfway across the world, okay? And as you're going halfway across the world, you zoom in and we get into Israel and we get to the Sea of Galilee. The northwestern corners is a city called Capernaum. And as we zoom in even a little bit closer to Capernaum, what you're going to see is this area, the Beatitude Monastery, where they've basically helped take care of this area where Jesus spoke this, on, this, uh, on this, uh, this Mount of Beatitudes. And you see that long stretch of land right there. And that is the actual uh, mount that he actually spoke at. And if you were to go there today, that's what it would look like. Isn't that beautiful? Right? So now imagine thousands of people there. So some people often ask, all right, so how would Jesus have spoken to thousands of people? Like he didn't have a microphone. He didn't have a headset. Very simple. That, that, that moan area there, at the time, that would have been this, this large open plain. It has a little bit of a s slope to it. And it has, it's a natural amphitheater. When Jesus would speak, his voice would actually carry it. And so I've actually been there. And when you stand up on it, you have somebody go a couple hundred yards down. And you can speak in just an elevated tone. And they can hear you from hundreds of yards away. So it's this really cool thing. So as Jesus is here and as he's speaking to all these folks, he's talking about salt and light. And it's really easy often to grasp when he says you're, you're the, the light of the world, right? Light is, you know, in the midst of utter darkness. Light pierces through. It provides perspective. It serves as a source of navigation and enlightenment to potential dangers. But when he says, what does, you know, like you're the salt of the earth, I tell you, if you Google that and check that out, you're going to find a lot of different answers, a lot of interpretations. But I think that sometimes people lose sight of perspective and context. So don't look at it through our lens. Look at it through the lens of the people back in that day. And when you do that, it's pretty interesting because um, we all think of salt as it provides flavor for food. And it does. But in addition, it also has a preservative property that the, in ancient Egypt, they actually used to apply salt to mummies to help preserve the mummy for a longer time. When you look at uh, the, the term salt in the wound, it comes from this perspective of a stinging or healing agent with restorative properties. Back in Leviticus, Leviticus 2.13, salt was required for offerings, to be applied to offerings before they could be presented to God. The Greeks believed that salt had divine qualities. It was so uh, a necessary part of their daily lives. Did you know that the word salary has its origins in the word salt? The word salarium, salary, describes payments that were given to Roman soldiers. So when a Roman soldier was, was paid, sometimes it would be in money, but also part in salt. They could then take that and then barter or trade for other goods, for other things, that, for food. And you've heard the phrase, being worth one's salt. So that had this connotation of a Roman soldier who he put in a hard day's worth of work. And, you know, all of that meant that he had earned his payment. He had earned the salt as payment. Fast forward a little bit. Salt actually played a role in American history. So during the Civil War, here in Virginia... In Saltville, Virginia, there was a salt processing plant, which was the stage for a 36-hour battle between Union and Confederate forces as the plant was viewed as vital to resupplying, to, to sustaining the, the Southern forces. So to Jesus' audience, the value of salt had perspective. It had context. So when he said, you're the salt of the earth, it meant something more than just flavoring food. But so we talked about, you know, even as milk is this transformative ingredient which brings Oreos to life, so salt and light are these in incredible transformative substances. One which infiltrates, penetrates, and saturates food. And the other which transforms darkness into illumination, cognizance, and understanding. And like salt and light, the church, each and every one of us, I challenge you, what Jesus is saying here is our goal is to live a life of impact in the world around us. We're not to be these passive participants. We have to be, if we weren't here, the world would miss us. If we're a salt and a light in this world, what does that look like? What is the impact we're making? You know, if I ask people, what is the story of the Bible? People have a lot of different answers, but at the end of the day, the Bible is basically a story of hope, 
and forgiveness and restoration. Do you think when the world thinks of the Bible and Christians, do you think they get that message? A lot of times I'd say that they, they, they don't. And if we're commissioned to be salt and light in this world, then why are we so often viewed as unsavory in our message? Not viewed as light, but as bearing a message of condemnation and sometimes judgment. I, I grew up in Florida. And before I went off to college, um, I worked a summer in this garage door manufacturing plant. And um, I don't know about you, but man, Florida's hot in the summer. And working in this, this, this warehouse, man, it was, it was tough. I mean, it was hard work. And we had, we, you know, we, we were out there building these, these garage doors. And there's one guy there, and for purposes of this, I'm going to call his name John. John had had a bad experience with a Christian. And we, he didn't get into all the details with me, but um, when he found out I was a Christian, I became a target every single day when I walked in. And he would greet me in one of three ways. He would either greet me with a one-fingered salute to tell me I was number one. And when I tell you the other two, you're going to realize how I really hope for that greeting every morning. Because the second one was he either mooned me or the third one was he slung a string of superlatives and curse words at me. And he didn't do it to be mean. He just wanted to let me know, hey, I know you're a Christian. That's what I think of it. Once he got that out of the system, we get to work. And we had a great time. And uh, at one point, he even, uh, he, he joked with me. He said, uh, hey, listen, I, you know, no matter how hard you try, I'm, I'm not going to go to your cult church. I said, that's right. You haven't been invited. He kind of stopped and he kind of smiled and we laughed. Fast forward into that story at the end of that summer. Uh, and I never invited him to our church. We just... Um, he wasn't really concerned with how many Bible verses I knew. He wasn't really concerned if I could, if I'd read the Bible zero times or one time or four times. That stuff was really kind of unimportant to him. What was important is that I knew his wife's name, that I knew how old his kid was. I still remember that his favorite band was Stone Temple Pilots. Okay? This is the stuff we developed relationship. And by the way, at the end of that summer, he would totally shock me. I'm there on drums back playing at my church, and I see him and his family walk in. I, okay, this guy didn't look like what you think a person who walks into church. Sometimes people think, oh, that person doesn't look like church. I don't know what that looks like, and that's crazy. But to those people, this guy didn't look like he belonged in church, and yet he was perfect. Now, he would later tell me that, you know, the music wasn't, our music wasn't like Stone Temple Pilots, but yeah, so okay, I got it. But the point was, he saw something different. And by the way, listen, anybody in here who knows me could give you the long list of things where I got a lot of mess ups and screw ups. And, and if you ever want to know, just ask my family. They have, I'm sure, a ton, a really long list of that. Ask the kids in Awana who I've ministered with over the years. And yet in spite of that huge imperfection, you know, there was something that shone through and I just wanted to be a little bit of Jesus to him because this guy was never going to open a Bible. Let's be really clear. But for whatever reason, in that short bit of a summer, I got to be a little bit of a Bible to him. And so what does being salt and like look, look like, right? So sometimes it means maybe going over and mowing your neighbor's lawn. Could be volunteering at a local school and then just helping kids with science or math homework, baking cookies for someone's birthday. Could be being part of a community of believers who are trying to make a difference. Like here at CFC, we have this thing called Square One. Kicks off again in January, and um, it'll be offered at 11 a.m., room 302. Shameless plug. It's how do you get connected here with other believers? Listen, I might step on a couple toes here, but that's all right. Being salt and light could mean before you hit post on that social media post that you think about it. By the way, I also want to say that I don't think God's radically impressed with which political party you support. If you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, if you're an independent or anything else, if you voted for or against Trump, for or against Biden, Clinton, Bush, take your pick, fill in the name. I, don't, I really don't think God cares nearly as much about that as, as he does about having a relationship with each of you and the example and the witness you are to the world. I'm literally in a movie theater the other day and this lady is yelling about a certain administration, yelling at the screen, yelling at the screen. In a movie theater, I'm sitting there like, she's making an absolute fool of herself. And then the family in the movie thing, they bow in prayer. She's like, that's right, that's what we need is more Jesus in this world. And I was like, seriously? <laughs> like, 
could you please stop that? Because everyone around is looking at her. I'm like, yeah, no, no, I'm not that. Trust me. Okay? I want to reemphasize it. He radically desires relationship with and righteousness from each of us. So now, take a step back. Um, who are the only groups, who are the only groups in the Bible who Jesus regularly had some type of vitriol for? He, he regularly criticized. Anybody know? Two groups. That's right. I heard of both. So demons or evil spirits, right? And then the religious elite of his day. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. Those are the only two. You look at his response to sinners. It was never con condemning. He had, a, he had a moral code aligned. Hey, stop sinning. You're forgiven. Don't do it again. But he was never condemning except for those two groups. But Christians often make the mistake of taking the, like the, the, the religious leaders and they discount and say, yeah, we don't want to be like that. Interesting story, though. Jesus actually has a different perspective on it. He doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, literally in the next paragraph, if you take this Sermon on the Mount, after he gets done talking about salt and light, Fast forward to like the next paragraph, and in verse 20, he says, hey, for I tell you, unless your righteousness, tag that word, we're going to come back to it, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute, what? So you're saying my bar for entering the kingdom of heaven is being more righteous than these clowns? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, I, so when I read that, I was like, wait a minute. Let's see if righteousness has a different meaning, right? So I went into the Greek. Check this out. And when I did that, I actually it came my way with something, an interesting part of this. So the word righteousness in the Greek here is this word, dikaiosune, okay? Dikaiosune. That in and of itself doesn't mean anything except for what Jesus is actually saying. What it means is equity of character or actions. And when we talk about equity, equity in this context is simply the qualities of being fair or impartial. So now put that, put that back into context of what he just said. Jesus is basically saying that if our personal character and our actions don't at least demonstrate fairness or impartiality, greater than that of these folks he was constantly banging on, the, the, the religious lead of the day, if we don't exceed that, then why would we think that heaven is in our future? Right? So we're too often so focused on being right politically, when I say right, I mean correct, or correcting others spiritually that we miss Jesus' message about our own personal, authentic faith, our character, the equity of our actions. So being salt and light also, though, doesn't mean giving up and having no backbone and saying, oh, I embrace everybody. Hey, no matter what your sin is, I, and listen, no worries, I'm not going to call it sin. I embrace you. No, Jesus was really, really clear about sin. But he's also really, really clear that he loved the sinner. And why is it that message so often doesn't radiate? So when I see it, when I look around, I see a world increasingly alienated and confused by this message, this message of Christ. But what I want to do today, when I have this panel, I've got a panel of people way smarter than me. And I've asked them to come up and join me today. And we're going to talk a little bit about what being salt and light looks like in this world. And I've got people who have different experiences than I have, different ages. And all right. Welcome, welcome. All right, so what I want to ask each of you if you can do is if you can just briefly introduce yourselves. And then we just want to talk about a few things really quickly. So, um, Elena, I'll let you start. I'm Elena. I've been coming to this church for most of my life, and I play soccer. Love it. Love it. <laughs> I'm Alicia. Can you hear me? One, two. I'm Alicia, <laughs> and I know how to project. <laughs> but if we need mic. Give me the mic because other folks online. One, two, one, two. Testing. One, two. There User error. <laughs> my name is Alicia, and I am a musician, and my passion is people. My name is Roy Wunderlich, and uh, my passion uh, centers around family, my, my own family, my beautiful wife, my church family, and my men's ministry family. 
Awesome. So, so Roy and I share a, a, a passion for fast cars. Roy's got this beautiful Corvette that, like, it's just amazing. Every now and then he shares, if you're a friend of his on Facebook, you'll see these, these great posts. Um, Alicia, I got to brag on Alicia because she has, like, if you, any of you have ever heard Mariah Carey from, like, 20 years ago, she hit these, like, crazy stratosphere notes. Alicia can hit those today. We were at practice recently, and we were, we were doing something, and she kind of went and hit that note, and, like, the band's done, everyone's kind of, like, what? All right. And then Elena. I got to tell you, so Elena, for those of you who know Elena, she is, the, she is the quiet assassin. So if you ever see her on a soccer field, she is absolutely just, she, she blows by, she's so fast. I know this from personal experience, having played against her and been just utterly humiliated, but that's another topic. We'll get to that later. See, look at her. She just smiles. She, she's that, you know, it's always the quiet ones you got to watch out for. All right, so gang, so I've got a couple quick questions. Um, you know, we're talking about salt and light today. So what does being salt and light look like in your context? You know, in the world where you live, where you exercise, where you go to work, where you go to school, um, and what does that look like? And maybe Roy, I'll, I'll kick it over to you and you start us off. Sure, um, great question. I love this series and I love light. I've always been fascinated by light. As a young kid growing up, there used to be things called searchlights in the evening sky. And I remember as a kid looking up at these searchlights, and I knew that the source of those lights were something really cool going on. Uh, a fair, a carnival, a new car launch, or a movie premiere. And all I know is that I wanted to go to the source of that light um, and see what's happening, because something cool is happening. So fast forward, that's how I approach my work and my community life, is, is um, through, through my faith, through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, I, I try to roll through work and through my community life as, as that, um, that uh, searchlight, if you will. And that's through uh, being approachable, having joy and peace and calm and hope and all of that thing. So um, I would like um, one day that those, those folks that I'm doing that um, discover that searchlight uh, through Jesus' grace and come to me uh, as his source uh, at work. And um, it's not easy doing that all the time. It's, it's, it's really hard. I, I have to confess, I turn into a cranky Christian sometimes at work, but I have to check myself with that. But I think we are called to be, be that light in this community. Cool, cool. Anything else anyone wants to add? Or? No, I think that's good. All right. So what is a challenge, and Alicia, I'll kick this one to you first, but... What is the challenge you've experienced in living, what I talked about this, living a life of impact, a life that actually makes a difference, is relevant. What's, what's a challenge you've experienced living that kind of life as a Christian? Well, for me, I think the challenge is the fact that we're not perfect. And so we, we are salt and light, but we're not going to get it right all of the time. And that, for me, is very frustrating. <laughs> like if <laughs> you make I, a mistake, people are going to pounce on it. <laughs> exactly. I enjoy getting things right and, and doing well and succeeding. Um, and, you know, the word says in Romans 3 that we all have sinned and fall short. And that is the difficult part. Um, you know, we're constantly being sanctified and transformed by the light and love of Christ. Um, so when we fall short in those moments, that for me is, is a difficult part. And it's really, it's not the falling short that's a problem because that's inevitable. But it, it's the recovery from the fall <laughs> that, and, and the attempt to make new mistakes or really actually be transformed completely so that those falling short moments are few and far between. Yeah, Amen. yeah. Do you find people are very forgiving when you do, when you're just honest and authentic, you've got relationship with them? I think so, and I think, you know, you said it, that relationship is the key, yeah. you know, and I think that, you know, we live this life uh, and the real way that we're being salt and light is by investing in people and having relationships. So Jesus had relationships with all those people and people were always like, why are you hanging out with them? You know, but he had the relationship. So when you're in relationship with someone and you bring something up and you say, I love you and that person knows that you love them and you bring something up, they're much more open yeah. to receiving that rather than you, you know, not having a relationship with them and then trying to tell them what to do or, or make commentary on their behavior. Yeah. So I think relationship with people is really the key. Yep. Amen. You know the challenges. You know the challenges you guys have, have, have come across. Like, like 
Sorry. Wait, like when you like you do mess up, like if like people like judge you for it. So like. Mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's it's so easy for people to be judgmental and and like, do you find that people often have an accurate view of what a Christian is? Yeah. They do. So if they have, when they're when they're in that process, how do you how do you get past that? How do you make that right with folks? Just like having good like morals and stuff, and then just like being showing kindness. Yep. So. Yep. Awesome. So this last question, I'm going to actually ask Elena to start us off, and this one I'd ask for each of the the folks to provide as we kind of this will be the last question. But what advice do you have? for the folks in the room here about how to live an authentic faith and how to be salt and light, how to show, not just talk about, but how to show this gospel and contextualize it without compromising. Um, just like by living by good morals and stuff and then having like the same attitude that you'd have like on Sundays like throughout all the, like the whole week. Mm. So like, like. No, I love this. Good. Wait, wait, wait. Good. I, want you, I want you to pause because I, I wasn't going to read this, but she just hit on a super important point. And I texted it to myself thinking, I won't use this. Thank you. So there's a guy named Brennan Manning, okay? I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but he was a priest and author of the Ragamuffin Gospel. And he had this quote that DC Talk a long time ago um, opened their song, What If I Stumble? And it says, to your point, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Amen. That's true. Elena, that'll preach. I love that. That's, that's so true. When you know, people act one way inside here, and they walk out, and they're a completely different person. Yeah. Yeah. We're killing our testimony. By killing our testimony. That. People can exactly. people can, exactly. can see fake. Totally. Anything else? That's pretty much it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Alicia. You know, we uh, have a phrase in our family. Well, I, I have coined a phrase that I say a lot in our family. <laughs> that is, um, you be beautiful and let God handle ugly. Right? So, you know, uh, many of you know, I, uh, I'm married to an incredible Italian man. We have beautiful children and you know you see yourself in your in your kids you know and sometimes how you act in traffic is how they have <laughs> grown up to inherit or or display so we always say when someone cuts you off in traffic you don't have to respond when people do do things don't worry about that you you just make sure your testimony is intact and that you are being beautiful and then if you're doing that then you can let kind of let God handle anyone else who's not doing that. And you're doing an incredible job. Your daughters sweet. if you guys haven't met Alicia's daughters, two of the sweet I swear they need their own reality TV show. They're absolutely hysterical. So Roy. Follow yeah. us on Instagram, like and subscribe. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I think there's another, um, another purpose of salt, Reuben, and that I was thinking about that when you were talking about it, and that's as a, in, in uh, now times, is a de-icer, right? Mm -hmm. So oh, maybe, maybe the salt, um, we can be the de-icer to a cold heart, you know, but de-icers work over time, mm -hmm. and you have to be in that presence of the salt uh, with other people. So I think, I think it is important to be um, in community, be genuine, and... Um, you know, I, I always look at my wristwatch, put your wristwatch away and just talk to people, yeah. right? And just talk and be that, be that the ice or maybe that hard heart or that cold heart, uh, maybe we'll uh, start to defrost. Yeah. Make sense? Awesome. Awesome. Well, before they go, and they didn't know I was going to do this, but um, do I actually... Oreos? Do we get Oreos? Oreos. <laughs> so we've got a few things in here. What? Oh whoop, whoop. Ernie, thank you. Here you go. You can have that too. All right. So oh, we've yeah. got who likes uh, peanut? Let's see, peanut butter Oreos. Anybody want the peanut butter Oreos? Oh, All right. There we go. All right. Thank we've you. got the the chocolate flavor and the mint. Any, any particular? You choose. You choose. All right. I'll take this one. All right. Awesome. And the chocolate. There we go. All right. Thank you, thank you gang. Thank you. Everyone, give them a round thank of applause, you. please. Thank you. We're good. Thank you. That's fun, isn't it? 
I love hearing from people who have different life experiences from me and view the world a little bit differently. Um, and as we, kind of, as we kind of wrap up, I want to kind of tie this message in. And I really want to, I'm going to speak to everybody, but more so as this is Family Sunday, I want to speak to some of the youth who are out there. And some of you sometimes may wonder, what does being salt and light look like? How can I do that? I'm just a kid or I'm just a young adult or I'm college or career age. And I remember at that age sometimes struggling with what could I do? And so what I want to do is, can you throw it up here? All right. Come on, Grace, let's see it. Love it. All right. So let me ask, what are these? Soccer ball, basketball, pretty straightforward, right? So, you know, at face value, these are things that, um, man, I, I sunk a lot of hours of my life into. Started playing basketball when I was in fourth grade in Indian Town, Florida. Uh, at that point, it was like 70% migrant workers. Um, let's be very clear, I was usually the only person on the court with this skin color. Um, I had to learn a lot of lessons, taught me a lot. Um, been playing it ever since, love to play it. Um, I will not tell you the full story about how recently when I was playing at Ida Lee, um, I s just kindly suggested during a break to my team that maybe we do this crazy thing called maybe play a little defense. And one of the leaders of the team looked at me, he's like, told the rest of the guys, like, yeah, 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 hey guys, that's right, we need to do that. We need to listen to old school. I was like, what? Seriously? I'm old school? The fact that I was twice everyone's age may have been part of that. Um, and, you know, I look at like, you know, this, this soccer ball and I look at this as it's easy to say, hey, listen, did a lot of cool things. My, my high school team, we won a state championship, went to nationals. We did all this cool stuff. Man, I've had some really fun experiences. But these are much more than just a soccer ball and a basketball because the doors that these open for me are things that I'll never forget. And I've seen some lifelong impacts from them. Like... I could tell you about how when I was in college and myself and a group of guys, we would go to um, the Tulsa Boys Home once a month. And we'd go hang out with these kids. And, and these were kids who, for one reason or another, had been separated from their parents. Parents in, in, in jail, parents had died, parents couldn't afford to keep them. And so we would just go there every month. We'd just simply hang out. We just play with these kids, man. We'd play ping pong, and we'd play, you know, we'd play foosball. But the big thing was basketball, man. We played a lot of basketball with them. And after a few months of this, um, the, the the head of the Tulsa Boys Home, who I was interacting with, he let me know. He said, "Hey, Reuben, just just so you know, I know for you guys, this is just coming out and playing with a bunch of kids. But what you don't realize is these kids have they don't have a ton to look forward to. Like every month when you guys are getting ready to come, they circle this on their calendar." They're all there for this because this is that one thing that they look forward to more than anything else. And you guys just come, you're this big brother that they've never had. You're this friend who they've never had care about. Them. I remember I told that story to, to the guys on my wing and it was just so much more impactful when you realize, yeah, this isn't just a basketball. And I could tell you about when I was in Honduras on a missions trip and and we, we were there working with this, these orphans and we had a chance to, to, to play soccer or as they call it, football. And, um, and we played on this field and this bunch of, bunch of these orphans who again, just they lived a life, man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish on anybody. But for that brief, you know, couple hours we're playing with them, man, you saw these kids just come alive and they're playing soccer and they're having a blast. Um, I could tell you about a missions trip I went on in 1996 and got to go over to England and I got to, to, to serve with these churches, little, little town called Drunfield Woodhouse, uh, just about six miles outside of Sheffield. And we, we got to do all this cool stuff. We, every Friday night, we'd go on this prayer walk. And this prayer walk was simply where we'd meet at the church, myself and some of the leaders. And I had one other uh, guy with me from uh, on the mission trip. The rest of the team was in another part of England. And We'd meet at the church and we'd just simply pray. And then we'd go out and hit the streets. And when we'd hit the streets, there was, you'd find these kids and they had their certain spots they all hung out, ages 12, 13, 14, 15. And all they would do is, because there wasn't a whole lot to do there, so they'd get together every week and they'd just drink. And so they'd get, so we'd go to them. Never once preached to them, never once, we just talked. They thought our American accent was funny. They'd ask us to say things. They'd ask us if we, you know, if we, if we had cowboy boots and wore a six shooter and all sorts of crazy stuff. We're like, what kind? Okay, you need to get like a little bit more recent in your movies, you know? 
and we had this blast. We had a blast with them. Um, we then got invited to go into the schools there, and they said, hey, listen, you can come in. We'll get all these, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders, and you can come in, but you can't talk about Jesus. We said, okay, is that our only restriction? They said, yep. We're like, we got this. We'd bring them in. We'd talk to them all about God. We'd have them reenact Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath and Noah's Ark. And these kids who didn't know much about Bible, man, they could sure act and make silly fools of themselves. And we had just a blast. And I have to admit, I'm a little bit of a trash talker when it comes to sports. So when one 13-year-old, and yes, I'm not above trash talking a 13-year-old. When one 13-year-old said he could smoke me because I was old. And again, I'm in college at this time. I wasn't old. But he says, smoke me in soccer. I'm like, oh, game on. So two weeks later, we're out on the pitch. We're playing football with these kids and having a blast with them. Fast forward to the end of the summer. Last prayer walk. We show up at the church. It's going to be the last night, a chance to say goodbye to the kids. And uh, the leader of the church there said, hey, listen, I just got to run in and get something real quick. So we all walk inside. Church doors open. Church doors open and, 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 uh, and all of a sudden we hear surprise and all these banners and there's food and streamers and all these kids who we'd go out on these prayer walks with, these kids who had never set foot inside a church, wanted nothing to do with it. They had come to the church leadership a couple weeks before that and they said, hey, listen, we'd like to rent your church out to throw a good, goodbye party for the Yanks. We just want to tell them how much they meant to us and just say thank you. And of course, the church leadership was like, hey, listen, you don't need to rent nothing out, all right? You tell us what you want, we'll buy it for you. And they bought all this stuff. And in this room were all these kids who didn't know basically how to spell Jesus, basically. But they knew that there was these two guys, these two Yanks from America who'd come in, just goofed off with them, hung out with them, played football with them, and just had the time of their life. When I look back, that moment moved me in my life, and it gave me a different perspective about what these balls are. It's not just a soccer ball, not just a basketball. That became a tool for me to be salt and light in a world where salt and light may not have penetrated. There's other folks who couldn't have in, talked with those kids. And in your world, there's people who well, I wouldn't be able to relate to them like you can. One of those kids in that youth group that we helped serve in that, he ended up becoming a youth pastor. He and I maintain a great friendship to this day. We're actually texting back and forth yesterday through Facebook. Um, Andy, if you're ever watching, I love you. Um, that's that permanency of the gospel. That is that impact of being salt and light in a world and in a way that it may not make sense. And so my challenge to each of you today is simply this. What is in your context, being salt and light look like? Who are the people that only you can reach, that you have some type of relationship with them, that it, you, don't, you don't need to preach. Your life will speak way more than anything you'll ever, you'll ever you know, you try to present them. So if we could just bow our heads today, I just simply wanna pray, a simple prayer. And I'm gonna ask that as our eyes are closed, we're just bowing our heads that you just think about what are those things in your life, whether it be where you work, whether it be where you exercise, whether it be your friends, your family, what are those things that, you, that only those people that only you can reach? And I'll also ask you to consider what are those, those things that don't look like salt, that don't look like light, that all of us have and that all of us do in our lives? What are those things? How can we turn those over to, to, to God? Dear Jesus, thank you, Father, for, for being that ultimate example. As we look at every decision we make, if we filter that through, what would you first do? How would you first act? I pray that, Father, we would understand the transformative process that in our lives and the lives of those around us. I pray that as the church, we would be this salt and this light in a very real and tangible way to everyone we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen.